Our next speaker is Carlo Meijer from the Radboud University, the Digital Security Group. Carlo likes to break stuff. So he broke some uh, Digidea app once. Uh, he uh, did some research on the uh, OV chip card some years ago, breaking that uh, crypto. Um, I hired him myself to check our uh, Edu VPN solution. So he tried to break that one too. In the end, he found some uh, issue in the library we were using. That was nice. So this uh, presentation is all about the uh, SSD uh, encryption. Carlo, good luck. Thank you. All right, so um, this talk's titled Self-Encrypting Deception Weaknesses in the Encryption of Solid State Drives. Um, some shameless self-promotion. Um, who am I? I'm Carlo Meyer. I'm a PhD student um, studying at the Radboud University. Um, my research is mainly focused on breaking stuff. Um, and if, you're, if my research appeals to you, then you're in luck because I'm also an independent researcher and you can hire me. Um, so let's start with the, with the real basics. Uh, so what is a self-encrypting drive? So normally if you encrypt documents, uh, you'll have some, some plain text document, um, some encryption algorithm, and you, you feed a key to that. Uh, which is just basically a random set of characters. And uh, out comes some cipher text, which you shouldn't be able to reverse back into the plain text without having the actual key. And this ends up in the storage device. Now, a uh, self-encrypting drive is basically all of that, except that it's all integrated into a single product. And you probably say, well, that's handy dandy. Uh, but there's some, some, some issues with that, and we'll get to that. So, um, down at, the, at its core, uh, you might think this is like it's hardware, so it's a, it's a sort of a Fort Knox. But uh, actually, uh, down to its core, it's just software. It, it's just a microcontroller with some ARM core. Uh, you can look up these specs and uh, you'll see for yourself. Um, there's another example of this. Um, and these things typically even have uh, debug ports on them. So this is... Uh, yeah, so, so, so this is one of the, of the examples that you could just hook up a debugger to. Um, there's another. Um, okay, so um, given these things are uh, pretty much like the implementation isn't uh, very, very documented whatsoever, actually. Um, this hasn't been theoretically proven uh, so much. It's, it's more of uh, been democratically proven, like people started using them and sort of felt okay with it. So um, this is sort of the marketing fluff around it, like um, it's being presented, being posed as being um, vastly superior to, uh, to, to software encryption. Um, so there's, there's studies released, um, I don't know who conducted those, but um, apparently there were. Um, hardware security, hardware-based encryption is very secure, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a list of uh, advantages that you get that you don't have with software encryption. Now, most of these aren't lies. It's, it's I mean, but most of these don't apply to security. There's, there's this more, more of a, a management and usability uh, kind of advantages that you get with these, which is fair. Um, Oh yeah, and by the way, uh, if BitLocker, so if you're using Microsoft Windows and you're, you're turning on its, its internal BitLocker encryption feature, uh, it will query the drive like, hi, do you, by the way, support this standard of full disk encryption? And if you do, you do the, the heavy lifting and I'll just do nothing. Okay, so, um, so yeah, yeah, that, that actually changed uh, recently, yeah, that because of, uh, of, of our research. So, uh, what are the actual security guarantees? Like, like let's uh, dive, let's let's throw away the uh, set aside a bit of the marketing fluff around it. Let's see what the actual guarantees are. Uh, so, for that, we'll just play uh, the attacker model game. So, this is more of a theoretical approach. We'll dive into the practice later. Um, theoretical approach. So, you have like three uh, main uh, attacker models that you have with full disk encryption. So, the first one is the PC is on. Um, or the PC is off, um, and the, 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 there's a physical encounter with the attacker and the PC, uh, but the physical encounter hasn't been noticed by the, by the victim. Or the, the PC is off and the, the victim is actually aware of it, and from that point onward you can't expect the victim to actually enter a password in, the, in his laptop anymore. Uh, or the device is stolen, which also falls into this category. 
So let's take a look at the first one. So uh, if the PC is on and you have software encryption, then pretty much all bets are off. Um, that's that due to the fact that the secret key is kept in RAM. Um, there's many ways that you can try to extract the key from RAM. Uh, the first one is, for example, a cold boot attack. So um, you, reload, you, you reboot the, the laptop, uh, you load some custom OS that basically extracts every, every, everything that's in RAM and you, you try to sift through that to see if the key's in there. Uh, second one is DMA attack. So for example, you use Firewire or a Thunderbolt in order to directly access the memory through some peripheral interface. But you can also just take away, if you want to go really hardcore, you can just like uh, extract the physical RAM modules and put them in some dedicated reading device. Uh, hardware encryption is immune in theory because it doesn't keep the key in RAM. Although, in practice, it does, because uh, that's, that happens due to the fact that it wants to support uh, suspend to RAM, which is like standby mode, in which every device is turned off and the RAM is kept powered. Uh, so if you resume from standby, then you have to either re-enter your disk password, because the drive is powered off, so it must be unlocked again, or it just kept that key somewhere in its memory. Now you can guess, you can probably guess where that key is stored. It might be obfuscated, but it's for, for sure that it is there. Um, and also the key is kept in the storage controller, and the storage controller in itself is not a secure hardware device by any standard. Uh, and as you saw, uh, many have uh, debugging uh, ports on them. So if the adversary has physical access, there's even an additional attack factor that you have. Like you can hot plug the device. Um, some researchers that came before me had tried this, and uh, they had like uh, they were very successful at it. So this is a real threat to uh, physical uh, security when the PC is on. So let's 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 say like the chances are are any. It's 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 definitely not in favor of hardware encryption. But in this attack model, uh, let's say it's more or less equivalent. Um, so that brings us to the next attacker model. Uh, the PC is on and the victim is unaware, so that this calls for the evil maid attack. Um, like the name itself already brings to some, some, some scenario to mind. So uh, there's someone in your, uh, so you left your laptop unattended in your hotel room and someone comes in, installs backdoor functionality. Then wait for you to enter secret key and out goes the data. Okay, so what are examples of these? For example, a hardware keylogger. Uh, there's not much you can do about that. Uh, you can do, uh, for example, a backdoor in the bootloader. Um, there's some protection, but they apply to both software and hardware. So there's all, in this case, there's also not much of a difference between software and hardware encryption. Uh, so let's call it equivalent as well in this uh, scenario. Which brings us to the third scenario, and this one's interesting because this is actually where the software encryption shines. Um, so it provides full data confidentiality, given that the implementation is sound. And so you have several options. You can go for uh, nice and open, software, open source software, and which is preferably audited. Or you can use some proprietary uh, package um, whereby the, the implementation details are published. Or you can live on the edge and, uh, and try the black box. Uh, which is which is a possibility. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how much you like to play uh, roulette uh, every once in a while. Uh, but for hardware encryption, you don't have any of these options. You can basically the only the only option you have is the black box. Um, it, yes. Uh, maybe it is, but like several people uh, came before me and they audited the software. For example, TrueCrypt True, True is fully audited. Um, there's, uh, there's implementation details about BitLocker. Actually, you can mount BitLock volumes from Linux. Um, so like if there's any serious stuff going on there, um, I'm, I'm assuming, like I'm making assumptions here, but this has probably been, been done before and probably nobody found anything serious there. I'm saying probably because I haven't looked at it personally, but yeah. There was a reason that was ordered. Yes. Uh, yeah. So um, anyway, uh, hardware encryption is extremely hard to audit because all you have is like this binary firmware image, if you can get those. Um, and there's even additional um, pitfalls that only apply to hardware encryption and not to software. Um, but we'll get to that later. So uh, given this overview of attacker models, um, the takeaway message is the security guarantees are equivalent at best. 
Um, and as you'll see later, um, it's, it's, not go, it's not faring very well. So with that, I'll take you to, through some standards for hardware encryption. Uh, and so you had like this old and archaic ATA security feature set, which is basically uh, it, it, like your motherboard, the BIOS uses it. If you set a BIOS hard drive password, then it will use this standard. Uh, and there's a new more modern one, which is called TCG Opel, which is from the TCG, the Trust and Computing Group. They also designed the TPM interface. So now, suppose that you uh, want to implement hardware encryption yourself. So what you probably do is uh, you have this data structure and you store like two random salts and a hash. And so in comes a password from the host PC. You, you feed that through a keyed hash together with the first salt. You compare it, you compare the result to the hash value that you store. And if that matches, then you assume the password was correct. Then you reuse the same uh, user input as a password and you put that through the same keyed hash function with a different salt and that becomes your key. And now you have like a key that you can use for encryption. So far, this is pretty easy. Um, so let's let's take uh, take a look at how ATA would you, you, how you would probably implement APA, ATA. Uh, ATA is actually uh, it, it it was uh, it originated before uh, self encrypting drives were a thing. So uh, it came from the ATA standard. The ATA standard doesn't even mention encryption whatsoever. It's, it's actually been designed for access control and uh, vendors uh, basically retrofitted that into uh, self-encrypting drives. So um, what it defines is two passwords, a user password and a master password. And both are actually user settable, not just the user one. Uh, but the initial master password is factory set. And there's this setting called master password capability, which is either high or max. And high means that both the user and the master password can actually unlock the drive. And the max, uh, max means you can only erase the drive if you have the master password. So already, just given the standard, uh, it basically means you always have to set this thing to max or change the master password, or otherwise you're screwed because then you have like a factory default password that can access your data. Uh, and in practice, uh, the latter, so setting the, the bit to max, is even uh, insufficient as well. So, um, so how would you implement this? Probably something like this. So you have like uh, you have two data structures similar to the one before. Um, you have a key comes in, or I mean a password comes in. You put that, you feed that through a hash function together with the salt. Uh, you get a hash result. You compare it. And there's either there's a match or no match uh, given what, uh, what's stored. And then you do the same thing with the second salt. Uh, you decrypt that, you get like some intermediate key and you need that in order to support um, two passwords resulting in the same disk encryption key. So there's another decryption step uh, involved here. So that's probably how, like that's probably a straightforward uh, way to do it. Um, now comes TCG Opel. So this is the default, the de facto default for hardware full disk encryption. So uh, BitLocker uses it and whatnot. So this thing defines, you can, you can actually define multiple partitions, which we refer to as locking ranges. Uh, you can define multiple passwords, with the, which they prefer, refer to as credentials. And um, you're supposed to support, as a, as a drive vendor, that you can actually uh, unlock multiple ranges with a single credential, and also, a single credential, uh, a single range should be able to be unlocked by multiple credentials. This, so in database terms, this is many to many. So this, for, this is an example of a scenario that has to be supported if you want to be uh, TCD Opel compliant, which is crazy. So, um, oh yeah, by the way, you also have to be able to uh, scramble a range, which, may, which, which basically means uh, re-randomize the key for an independent range without knowing all the passwords that unlock that range, that particular range. So uh, this is fully trusted by, by BitLocker. Now try to imagine that you had to implement this. <laughs> I dare you, like, <laughs> this is not trivial stuff. And so um, yeah, it shouldn't come as a surprise that, that mistakes are made when, when manufacturers try to implement this. Okay, so what are the actual pitfalls that we looked at? And this is basically a list that we came up with, like, okay, uh, let's try to implement this, and what's stuff that people will likely make mistakes in? So the first one, uh, it's pretty trivial. So there's a password coming from the host PC, 
and there's some key being used to encrypt all the data. So how are those two related? You don't know. Um, that's implementation specific. Uh, what's worse, that you don't even know whether they are related at all. And if they are not related, that means that like, the disk encryption key doesn't depend on any secret whatsoever. All the data is already contained within the drive, so that means you can basically just unlock if you, just, if you know how to remove the password, protect, uh, the password check. So second pitfall, suppose that you would naively implement the scheme, you have multiple ranges, um, and you use the same key to encrypt all the data. That means that if you, if you know the weakest password, you can, ex you can access everything. Um, so even for ranges that you don't have permission to, those are just if statements that you can just uh, throw away, if you can manipulate the firmware that is. Um, and in the particular case of BitLocker, it leaves a single range always uh, unprotected. So that's where the partition table is. And so in that particular case, you can, the, the, like the disk encryption key is even recoverable without a key. It must be stored in plain text because if you're using the same key for the whole disk, then if you want to have a single uh, piece of, of, uh, of the disk accessible, then you need to store that key. So third, um, so bear with me. Suppose that you have a, a master and a user password. This is uh, ATA specific then you should set the master password capability a bit to high, as you know, because otherwise you have a backdoor. Um, so ideally, you would throw away this material. So this, so this data structure gives you access to the disk encryption key if you know the master password. So if you, don't, if you want to disable the master password, you should throw away that data, because otherwise you can still uh, theoretically obtain the, 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 the final key. So, there's a problem here because the ATA standard allows you to reset it to high without, with the user password. So you don't know the master password, so how are you supposed to reconstruct that data if you don't know its password? So, I mean, there's ways around this, but um, I haven't seen this at all being implemented correctly anywhere. So in practice, this material is just being retained. And therefore, uh, if, you just, uh, if you just extract it, if you, if you manage to find it, then you can just use the, 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 the factory default master password to unlock the drive. Uh, there's another uh, pitfall that's, uh, that has to do with wear leveling. So um, this basically means uh, multiple writes can actually uh, end up writing uh, different sectors. So if you write twice to the same sector, It'll, it might end up uh, in uh, becoming rights to different physical sectors. Um, this has to do with uh, flash shells, they wear down over time, so that you want to spread that out as much as you can. So there's some algorithm and some mapping in between that does that for you. So what happens is, this is oversimplification, but su suppose that you get the drive from the factory, there's, uh, then everything's encrypted by default, and the key is stored in plain text. So if you set a password, you basically take that key, you encrypt it with your password, and then you overwrite the old one. But what if that medium is wear level? Then the old variant, the plain text variant, would still be in there somewhere. And so if you manage to find that, then, uh, then basically you're golden. Okay, there's, there's other stuff going on that, that, uh, that's basically, uh, that happens everywhere. Uh, random entropy, which is like sort of a trivial, uh, a trivial issue. Uh, power saving mode, so there's a, a dev sleep mode that may or may not, it's manufacturer specific, dump all the RAM contents into the flash. You don't know. And if that is so, then there might be secret key material in, in there. Um, yeah. And generic, general implementation issues, like what mode of operation, uh, side channels, uh, how is the key derivation scheme set up, what, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, what's our met methodology? So, uh, yeah, it's, it, this is more an art than a science. It's uh, pretty ad hoc. So, um, but I'll try to, 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 to give you some, uh, some guidelines. So the first step is to obtain a firmware image. You, don't, you can't do anything without a firmware image. So how do you, oh, so yeah, um, the next step is to gain low level control over the device. So this means either debugging it or, um, or getting code execution. And then you can start reversing, analyzing the firmware and try uh, to trick the drive into doing things that it shouldn't. So uh, let's, let's, let's see how we get a firmware image. You can try downloading it. 
which seems easy, but uh, in practice it's, uh, it's harder than you might think, uh, because there's usually obfuscation applied. You, you, you typically you download some bootable ISO image and there's a firmware image in there, but it might be encrypted or whatsoever. Um, yeah, so, um, so on the right you have like, for example, Samsung uses a tool called Magician. Um, this is the, th this is like a decompilation output of the, of the, of the function that sets an AES key to decrypt the image. So like if, if you look li really closely, it says magician, but there's like the literal string is not uh, anywhere within the binary. So it's, it's pretty annoying to find, to look for, uh, for this because it's, uh, you have to, you have to dig deep. Um, okay, so suppose that the image is, uh, being decrypted on the drive itself during the firmware update, then that's a dead end because you don't know the key, the, the, the key's within the drive and you don't have a firmware image of the drive, so then you're stuck. So that, like, then the alternative would be to pull the, the firmware from, from RAM, uh, and we'll get to that now, um, if this thing is working. So, um, yeah, so you have more or less uh, equal capabilities in order to get code execution on the drive. Like the first one is JTAG, which basically allows you to control the drive like a puppet. Uh, you can halt the CPU, set registers, read right into the address space, uh, whatever you want. Um, some models have this in plain text, so there's a standardized ARM 14 pin layout that you can use, like some disks just have that. Um, others need some figuring out, so there's, uh, there's this fancy board that we used, uh, it's called a JTAGulator, and basically all it does is just brute force the pin layout and uh, it will give you the output, which is uh, neat. Um, there's, uh, like, the, the, the alternative would be, uh, you get pretty similar capabilities if you just have unsigned code execution. Now, it, like, if you just send a firmware update, this thing will check signatures, obviously. Well, obviously, yeah, yeah apparently they do. Um, so you have, to, uh, you have to, to, to find some way around it. So sometimes there's vendor specific commands that you can use in order to, uh, to, to get code execution. Uh, you can exploit a known vulnerability or uh, you can try to uh, interface with the memory chips on the drive directly with some, uh, with some equipment and uh, see if there's some code that you can modify. Uh, or finally, if you want to go really hardcore, um, you can bypass cryptographic signature checks with fault injection. Now, we didn't do that, that during our research. I'm just putting it out there as a possibility just to, to, to get the point across that there's no way that you can stop an attacker from uh, getting code execution on the drive. And there's, you need hardware mitigations for that, which is too expensive for, for, this, kinds of, uh, for this kind of purpose. Okay, so final step is to analyze the firmware. So once you got this far, uh, let's take a, 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 a look at the firmware itself, like how does it work? So figure out the section information. So you have a firmware image, it's decrypted, and so, so what does it look like? So you have to basically look at the, uh, at the data itself, just try to, uh, to try to make sense of the firmware header uh, through some hex editor. Um, uh, and then figure out where, what sections go where into the address space. Now, if you, have, if you know that, sometimes you need to reverse engineer a, a bit, but once you know that, then you can load it into a disassembler. In this case, we used IDA Pro for this purpose. And then you figure out what the firmware does. And that's easier said than done, um, but like a good starting point would be the ATA dispatch table, which, um, so uh, basically every drive that I've come across has this. Uh, it, it basically is some data structure, some table of data structures where there's an opcode and a function pointer and some other data. And you can cross-reference that with the ATA specification and the ATA specification tells you exactly what this command should be doing. So if you want to uh, look at a, sp a certain implementation of a certain command, which basically means always, that's basically always what you want, then you could just cross-reference the interesting command and then look at, at the function pointer and see what function is there and how it's implemented. So that's cool. Um, especially the vendor-specific ones tend to be really interesting. Um, yeah. So how about the case studies? Uh, I won't go through all of them, so uh, I've, I've uh, selected one that's uh, interesting, not because it was easy, but particularly because it was one of the harder ones. So um, we're going to take a look at the Crucial MX300. Um, so the previous, uh, its predecessor, the MX200, had JTAG switched on, 
And so, um, yeah, so they, they came to their senses and switched that off. Uh, also, the, the security code, like the full disk encryption implementation was pretty, uh, pretty, pretty bad. So they completely um, rewrote that. And there's still some vendor-specific commands in there. Uh, and so the old one had like really fancy vendor-specific commands that allowed you to basically write into the uh, raw address space without any signatures whatsoever. So that was neat. Uh, but this one, uh, those, so those commands are still there, but you need to unlock them first, and you need a cryptographic signature for that, which is asymmetric, so there's also no way to figure out what the key is. Um, there's a couple of buffer overflows that I've spotted, but none of them seem to be exploitable. So how do we get code execution on this thing? So for that, I've been looking at the boot process. So there's, uh, on the left, you see code in ROM, uh, which doesn't uh, directly load the firmware from Flash. There's a step in between. Uh, so there's a na so, so on the right you have like the, um, uh, so, sorry, uh, you have, so on the left you have the ROM code, which loads the next stage from an SPI Flash, and that code actually loads the actual firmware in RAM. Um, but the firmware in RAM is actually, uh, sorry, the, the firmware on the Flash chips are actually, uh, that's actually NAND Flash, so there's like a BGA chip, which is extremely hard to, uh, to, to take off and just read out physically. So how about we take a look at the SPI flash? So we're looking at this, this stage in between, and let's see if we can actually uh, interface with that SPI chip. It's there on the board, and, and see if we can, uh, we, we can make sense of it and see what it does. So, um, so this is a picture of my Crucial MX300 with uh, some wires hooked up to this flash, to the SPI flash. Um, so what you would do first in order to, to get code execution on this thing is like you hook, up, hook it up with a physical reader. You make a backup of the chip, obviously. Uh, you craft some code uh, that, that uh, removes signature checks from the firmware. So remember that you're not actually modifying the firmware directly. You're modifying the loader that loads the firmware. But in between uh, loading the firmware and actually transferring control to it, you can, you can patch some things. And so, yeah, so what you do is inject code that does that. And then you flash a modified stage two, uh, to the, so you write to this SPI flash. And now, uh, if everything was, uh, has gone well, then this drive should now accept arbitrary firmware images because you've checked, you patched out the, the firmware signature checks. And then you take a firmware image uh, <coughs> and you modify it as you please. So for example, you add some fancy capabilities like uh, read, write, and execute. And then you flash it as if you would normally send a firmware update to the drive, and it will accept it because the, firmware, uh, the, the signature checks are gone. Okay, so with that, um, let's, take a dive, let, let's take a look at the key derivation scheme. So uh, actually, there is a relation between the password and the final key used for encrypting your data, so that's good. And, but as required by Opel, there is a thing uh, for multiple ranges. So you have uh, multiple ranges and multiple credentials. So on the left, there's a credential table. And so you take the credential that you, that you want and you decrypt that with the password that you supply. <coughs> and basically that ends up with some key. And this key is the same, so it's called the RDS key. I don't know what it stands for, but I've, uh, basically they refer to it as that in the firmware. And the RDS key basically uh, grants you access to everything. Um, so it allows you access to all the protected ranges, and every password will yield that same key. Okay, uh, that's already pretty weak, but still, um, let's let's assume that like there's a like things aren't very weird, and you only have a single range set up that you want to protect. Then it's fine in principle, because uh, all the unprotected ranges, so remember the BitLocker scenario where the partition table had to be in clear text, those don't need the, uh, the RDS key. So basically those keys are stored in plain text and you don't need to decrypt them with the RDS key. So that's cool. Um, so yeah, so basically you're not supposed to access all the protected ranges, if, even if you know the RDS key, that's being uh, you, the, the firmware stops you from doing that, but there's nothing stopping you anymore from patching the firmware in order to bypass that. So, 
Um, everything is accessible with a single password, but in practice it's even worse. Um, so this is the, the function that, this is the decompiler output of the function that protects the password. So from the, from, the, from the name of the function, you would probably guess, okay, this is just some sort of a hash function, but it does more than that. Um, what it actually does is if you set uh, a Boolean parameter, uh, which I named, uh, conveniently named uh, store RDS key, then it actually takes your password and then encrypts the RDS key using your password. Okay, so in principle, this isn't too worrisome, but you shouldn't really be throwing around uh, the output of, the, of this function. So uh, from this slide, I have a bit of um, uh, a background to give you. So uh, we injected code uh, at different places in the firmware. So like you have, by default, you have like a firmware that does uh, several things, has, has several functions. We basically took a couple of interesting functions and we patched those so that it just does the original behavior that it's supposed to do. And in addition to that, it writes an entry in a log file, like, hey, I've been called and I've been doing this. So during the BitLocker setup phase, um, this is the log that came out. And um, yeah, so the interesting stuff is protect password and the password used is a zero buffer. And the, the flag for, set, for storing the RDS key is true. So, and then that, that, the output of that gets stored into some table and the, the entry gets copied to several slots in that table. And eventually uh, the range that you set up, that slot will be overwritten. But it doesn't matter because like the, the output is scattered everywhere. So it's an, it finally will end up in all of these slots and the decryption key is a zero buffer. So all you have to do is then basically try to decrypt that and then you have uh, the, the magic key that unlocks everything. So an attack strategy would be um, to get like this modified firmware on the drive and then craft some code that recovers the RDS key, just given the, the previous slide, and uh, decrypt it from slot 11 and then execute that code on the drive and then you have the RDS key. And once you have the RDS key, then you still, the firmware still stops you from accessing its data because there's like a, a password check in between that you still have to patch out, but that's if statements, so you can do away with those. And uh, then you can basically unlock any desired range with an arbitrary password. So um, I will hopefully uh, demo that now. So here goes. Um, I hope this is big enough for you. So, um, yeah, um, in case you're interested, I have the, um, uh, the Crucial MX300 here on the desk. So, and it's, uh, the flash is hooked up to a, a flash uh, reader device, so an external reader. The, the, the drive itself is not connected to the PC, so we're just interfacing with the flash alone. Because, as you uh, might recall, uh, we need to patch the, the, the SPI flash first. So what we're gonna do is, um, I've already made a backup of the, of the thing that's on the, on the SPI flash. So all we need to do now is patch it and overwrite the original. So that's what we're going to do now. Um, so first I have a uh, fancy make script that, ah, that's already there. So basically all it, yeah, for, Okay. <laughs> What's going on? There we go. Okay, so um, basically what I'm doing here is uh, I'm compiling some code and then um, dumping that into a binary uh, file and then I'm patching that into the firmware and there's some CRC values that need to be updated so there's a script that does that. Uh, there's a magic value in the header that it detected and yeah, so it basically it, it updates the, 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 the um, Checksums. Okay, now let's flash that onto the SPI flash. There we 
go. Okay. Now while that's flashing, I'll uh, I'll, I'll let you I'll show you the the thing that I did for setting it up. So this is a, a PC at my place, and I've I've been connecting the drive for the first time. So this is the um, so it's it's completely wiped. So uh, let's create a partition table. And now I'm creating a new volume. Um, just uh, standard anti-face, everything default. Have to wait for the format. Okay. So now we turn on BitLocker. Just enter some password. And then it wants you to store some uh, recovery key. So let's do that. And then you start encrypting, and that's it. So now the drive's encrypted. So um, you, may, uh, you may wonder why there is no encryption process, or like why doesn't it take, why, why does it seem instant? That's because it's using hardware encryption. And so hardware encryption basically just takes the key that it used for encryption and encrypts it with your password, remember? So um, it also doesn't ask you, like, would you like hardware encryption, perhaps? Maybe you don't trust this. Um, no, it just, it just delegates all the encryption to the drive. OK. OK, the flash is verified. So now um, I've uh, managed to, uh, to write to this, this chip. So now I'm going to unplug my, uh, my reader and hook up the drive to my laptop. Okay. Now, um, this is the partition table. So this volume is the interesting one. Suppose that we want to mount that, then you can't. So it basically just refuses uh, access to that particular sector. OK, um, now that we have that, let's, uh, let's flash our custom firmware. So the command is uh, interesting. Uh, yes, I know what I'm doing. Please destroy my drive. Uh, okay, let's, let's patch the firmware first. Make M0. What's going on with this thing? Okay, fingers crossed. Nice, okay. So the drive accepted the, the patched firmware. So now it's running that patched firmware. And so now we can do interesting things, like for example, this tool called Tinker. And so in Tinker basically, uh, so the argument is device, read, write, or execute, virtual address, and then an input or an output file. So what we're going to do now is read out the RDS key that it currently has in its RAM. So I, know, I, I happen to know the address for that. So um, as you can see, RDS, this thing is zero. So at this point, the drive is unaware of its RDS key. So uh, I have uh, some code that's called recover RDS key that basically decrypts it from this particular en table entry. And we're going to run that on the drive. So first we have to write it into its address space. OK, that went fine. And now we're going to run it. OK. And now I'm going to uh, read out the same RDS key again. And there it is. OK, cool. So now cryptographically we, uh, we won. So uh, now we still have to unlock the drive, though. So if I, if I do this, if I try to um, just use this uh, SED tool, uh, SED util, which is, open source, uh, which is an open source tool for managing TCG Opel drives, uh, if I try to unlock it with any password, it will basically refuse if it does anything at all. Oh, wow. 
wow, okay. Um, okay, wow, demo gods. Okay, let's go. Let's hope it's still alive. Um, so first let's do this. Still with me? No. Okay. Let's unplug it. So basically, do that thing again. Execute it. Read it out. See if it's there. It's there. Okay. So now let's try to unlock it again. That went fine. Okay. So there we have it. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so apparently this, uh, according to some, this is the best in class of hardware encryption. Uh, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not that's true. Uh, anyway, so the results of our finding were pretty devastating. Uh, so we looked at nine case studies, and from the right you can probably see uh, that it's, uh, it didn't fare well. Um, I mean, yeah, there's, there's some Samsung drives that are an exception that we looked at, but uh, the overall picture isn't a, a very bright one. Uh, yeah, so we looked at uh, different models, different form factors, um, and most of them have severe weaknesses. Uh, the best case scenario is, uh, as stated previously, the security guarantees are equivalent uh, to software in uh, full disk encryption. And in worst case, um, you don't know what the, what the hell just happened. Um, yeah, and also BitLocker delegating trust uh, is, makes the, uh, the issue even worse, which luckily uh, they fixed uh, recently. Uh, furthermore, TCG Opal is pretty terrible. Uh, like it's 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 so vastly uh, complex that uh, people tend to make so many mistakes with this. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what we call over-engineering. The security goals are not clear. Like there's no clear benefit in terms of security over regular software encryption. And uh, there's no there's even no reference implementation. So every vendor has to basically reinvent the wheel, figure out how will we set up the key derivation scheme and whatnot, and then you get this. Um, and also the implementation uh, is not even part of its compliance test. So basically all that the compliance test does is like, okay, if I send the wrong password, does it not unlock? If I send the right one, does it? That's that's compliance for you. And so there's pretty structural changes needed in this department. So with that, uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. If I follow correctly, it mm -hmm. was an uh, evil maiden attack, or no, no, no. This is like the this this you get the the drive from the cold storage, so it is not turned on whatsoever. It's you just you uh, you flashed the the ROM of the drive, mm -hmm. but uh, how does the the key is not on the uh, drive, or the, yeah, the, the the password is not on the drive, but the RSA uh, key yes is, is, is uh, you you can uh, get from the What's stored on the hard disk? So um, this is the important uh, detail. So um, so what you get from this scheme is uh, the RDS key. That's basically the thing that you're going for. Yeah. So the RDS key is uh, basically this is the, the the function that there you put you uh, you feed a password to it and then it encrypts the RDS key using that password. So this function is being called during the setup phase. So when you first set up the drive in order to use encryption, and so it uses zero buffer as a password and it just stores it. So basically if you manage to find the output of this function, which is just stored on the flash, you can just decrypt it using a zero buffer. Yeah, step. yeah okay. Is there for setting passwords a uh, limit of length of password and uh, characters? 
so yeah, basically what, what it's sent to the driver is a 32-bit buffer, uh, sorry, 32-byte buffer. Um, but yeah, that basically means it's SHA-256 uh, in most implementations of, uh, of provisioning tools uh, or like in some, some PBKDF function. So then in that case, the, the number of characters is limitless. And is there a, a, a system uh, preventing for brute forcing passwords? Um, yes, there is. So after a number of tries, you have to um, you have to power cycle the drive in order to have uh, an, again a number of possibility possible uh, tries. Have you calculated how uh, with um, power cycling how many oh, how long and it would take to brute force? Uh, no, but um, I reckon that it's uh, that's pretty much impossible. Yeah. So apart from uh, Opal being broken, basically, um, mm -hmm. what would be a good mitigation for attacks like this? Uh, for example, all, all these iPhones now have these uh, secure enclave coprocessors on them, mm -hmm. uh, which basically stores the secret and doesn't let it go. Would that work in this use case? Um, so the, 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 uh, the issue with an iPhone is that you enter a pin code or a fingerprint, which is very low entropy. So therefore, you need uh, a secure hardware in order to store a key for you, because otherwise you'd be able to brute force it. With full disk encryption, there is no issue. You, there's software encryption, and the solution has been lying in front of us all, uh, all that time. You can just take it and use it, and it, you'll be fine. You can, if you want, use a TPM. Uh, but yeah, again, that's that's again a black box. Well, so. I'm, I'm more looking towards, um, it's, it seems that most drives have a problem protecting the key whether it be the key is uh, somewhere stored in RAM or encrypted with a zero length key. <laughs> yeah. So what would be a good countermeasure to protecting the, the disk encrypting key itself? Um, if you want to, I, I mean, it depends on the manufacturer in, in to, to what extent things went wrong. Um, but I would say like heavily, like make it an extremely simple standard, just one password and you get the full range of data and that's all that, that, that that's, that's all there's to it. There's no way that you can screw that up. Um, uh, I mean, <laughs> don't take my word for it. People will find it. <laughs> but um, I think that would be uh, the long-term solution because I don't see how this will, will fare well in the long term if, if manufacturers have to, 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 to keep reinventing the wheel. And what may, I mean, you could go for like maybe a reference implementation that's sound and have, have like um, basically poked manufacturers so that they open source their implementations. I think uh, Western Digital was looking into that, that, those kinds of things uh, seriously. But overall, I would say, um, like as, as things are now, I would just not trust it. <laughs> okay, thank you. No further questions. Well, I have a bit of topic question. My Windows PC is using a software uh, bit locker, software mm -hmm. encryption. But somehow, sometimes with certain Windows updates, I don't need to type in my password at boot. Mm. So apparently Windows has some overruling mechanism and I assume the password is then stored in partition table or so, probably in plain text. So so for convenience, it seems even software, yeah, there, well, it feels to me like a potential backdoor. Yeah. Have you looked upon this topic? No? Okay. okay. Well. Um, is, is there some time left? Well, it's lunch, so probably. Yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, if, if there's any interest, um, I've also brought another model that I can demo if you want. Uh, yeah? yeah. That, does that sound good? Cool. Um, okay, so let's do it. Let me unmount this drive first. So this is the um, Samsung uh, T3 portable. So I've taken it out of its enclosure and I've connected a JTAG debugger to it because this thing has JTAG. Um, so let's connect it.
Samsung. Cool. OK. So this is nice, right? Um, you can't access the, uh, its contents. You have to enter a password. OK, that's all. Uh, so and if I enter something random, obviously, that doesn't work. OK, so um, let's try something. So this is OpenOCD, which is an open source tool uh, to, uh, to talk JTAG. So I have to tell it to use my Altera USB blaster. Uh, target. Device not found. What's going on? Oh, there it is. OK, so it detected two cores. Uh, I've defined a third one, but it's for a different drive. But um, So anyway, this thing has two cores. Um, so if I now tell net to localhost, I can control this thing. So, so for example, let's do this. So now the, it's the, the, the core number zero has stopped executing. So now I can, for example, um, read out the registers. And I can get, I can set, I can uh, read out, um, I can read from RAM. So for example, um, did I, MVN, is that? I don't know. It's been a long time. Uh, Yeah, anyway, I can read and write into the address. Oh, wait, that's, um, I've actually did that. Samsung T3. Patch. Um, so, for example, this is address zero. And this is 32 bytes reading from address zero. So, like for the for the hardcore reverse engineers a bit, uh, among us, this is a, the intro vector table, and this is basically uh, a jump to some offset. And this is um, so this is a jump to itself. So basically, the reset vector basically infinite loops, and this is a jump to some uh, offset, and this is another jump to another offset. Anyway, I'll just. I just figured I'll show you that you can just debug this thing and you can control it and you do can, can do whatever you want. Okay, so um, let's set a breakpoint at this address and I didn't choose this address uh, as a coincidence. So now if I enter a password randomly, it, oh, it, it uh, glitches. Uh, let me fix that. So if I disable security, then it seems to work. Then it hit that breakpoint. OK, so now I'll just remove the password check. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go, the security is disabled. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'll just reconnect the drive and see if everything worked. And there it goes. Okay. okay, hope you liked it. Wow. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>